When your heart's cried out for the fullness of God and you've been believing for the power to come from on high, as the scripture says, and you don't experience it at that moment, don't let it be stolen from your heart. Be as excited and, and anticipating the next day as you were at that moment and the next day and the next day until the promise comes. Amen. Don't lose sight of it. Don't lose the hunger. Don't lose that that expectation that at any moment God's fullness is going to rise up. Expect to wake up in the morning full of the Holy Ghost, praying in a new prayer language. Hallelujah. Today on Sword of the Spirit, Normative Christianity. But the scripture says the Lord has gone to prepare a place for us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Hallelujah. Everything you can imagine heaven to be, it's infinitely greater than that. <laughs> Glory to God. Think about it. You know, we can fantasize, we can dream, you know, our minds can become pretty creative and we haven't even scratched the surface of what it's going to be like. We read the scriptures, we know the presence of God and the peace that it brings. Think about the greatest visitation that you ever had with the Lord. It doesn't scratch the surface. You're going to live forever in his presence beyond anything you could imagine, praise God. That saturation of love and peace and joy, contentment, thankfulness, hallelujah. Neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Oh, glory. I hope we don't have to wait till the 23rd. <laughs> come today, Lord. Amen? Amen. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And that's to be our, our continual prayer. We're a blessed people to know him. And you know, the great, great truth that Paul brings in Romans, the good thing is that Though none of us have ever sought after God, there's not a man that ever sought God. God sought every one of us. Amen? Amen? Paul makes it clear. And while we were yet sinners, he loved us and died for us, praise God. And so we realize in that great love and compassion that he, he has for your life, for my life. But you know, it's for the whole world. The Bible says God's not willing that any would perish. Now, part of the responsibility of reaching all of those that God loves falls upon the church. He's called us, the scripture makes it very clear and ordained us, John's gospel says, that we would go and bring forth fruit and that our fruit would remain. His great commission was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. Then shall the end come. Hallelujah. And so the Holy Spirit's been stirring our hearts just to be busy about Father's business. Jesus has sent us forth to preach this kingdom in all of the world. He said he's given us power. And authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm us. And so we want to share this morning a little bit about normative Christianity. What it really means to just be a normal Christian. You know, today people seem to think that if you go to church more than, than uh, Christmas and Easter, that you're some kind of special Christian. And then others would think that if you go to church more than just Sunday morning, you know, you're super saint. And dear Lord, if you go on a Wednesday night. But, you know, the scripture says, and we'll look at it here in just a moment in the book of Acts. But, you know, the scripture is very clear 
that the church met every day. And they took seriously the mandate that Jesus, the head of the church, had brought forth about their need to gather together and to edify one another continually because of the hour that they were living in. And the admonition comes to you and I, and the scripture is very clear, that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. That we're to gather even more earnestly at every opportunity even more, the scripture goes on to say, as you see that day, the return of the Lord coming, even more. Now think about that. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner have, of some has become. There's been kind of just a letting up a little bit. But stop and remember the day you're in, the apostle says, and get together more than you ever have as you see that day approaching. Well, if normative Christianity was every day, we don't have eight days. So we need to take advantage of the time that we do get together daily and make sure that we're seeing each other provoked unto love and to good works. Amen. That we can lift up the hands among us that are hanging down, that we're to comfort the feeble minded. Do any of you feel feeble minded periodically? discouraged, times of doubts and fears, life's getting bigger than you can handle, just the recognition of our own weakness. And we need to come together at times like that and have our brothers and sisters remind us, hey, when we're weak, that's when God's strong in us. Amen? Amen. We need to encourage one another with the scriptures. We may be cast down, but we are not forsaken, praise God. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all, praise God. Amen? All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. These are all verses that we know and have memorized, but we're coming into an hour when that's going to become real. You know, it's, it's on the horizon, and, and many of us don't think it could possibly happen here in America. It not only is possible, it's already happened and we've shared this in the past. We are no, we're no longer not a, only a Christian nation. We are not a Christian nation. As Francis Schaeffer and many of them wrote back in the 70s and talked about America coming into a post-Christian era where we've lost the Judeo-Christian ethics as a nation, when they took the Bible out of school, when today they're wanting to remove, you know, the Ten Commandments from different courthouses, etc., around the nation. Yes, we came into a post-Christian era in the 70s and 80s. But America is no longer post-Christian. America is becoming anti-Christ. And it's amazing to me how you can on the job or in society. Oh, you can speak about your newfound enlightenment through Buddha and people may kind of snicker. You know, and, and think that some of the mystical Eastern religions are, are a joke. But, you know, we realize that Eastern mysticism has taken a stronghold since the 60s in our country. And so people will talk about that and that's fine. And tragically, even in this country, we've seen it and especially the, uh, the water they're drinking in California to where certain school systems were requiring children 
elementary school children to take on Muslim names and begin to learn certain aspects of Islamic doctrine as a way of just broadening their horizon and making them more tolerant because of the influence of the past of the Judeo-Christian ethic. And so to be fair and to be tolerant, we should take a broader look. And that's fine. My question would be, where in the school system in America then are we encouraging our children in elementary school to learn the name of the 12 apostles? To recite the Lord's Prayer? To memorize scripture? not even allowed to have a silent prayer that might indicate Jehovah God and the resurrected Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Yes, an anti-Christian society. The name of Jesus is so offensive to most people in our society today, especially of the elite scholastic minds. You know, the people who want to tell us how to live. Do you realize there's an elite group of educators in this nation that see us as nothing but a bunch of dumb sheep that don't know how to think and fend for themselves? So they will take over and through a sociolo uh, through uh, socialism, be able to come in and set us all equal and in a proper place where they as the elite can rule over us and keep us safe. Enough of our politics for this morning. But I'm saying all that to say the church, so much of the church is sitting by and unaware of what's taking place. And I want you to know that our only biblical defense is offense. We are to go into all of the world and make disciples. Amen. Amen. We're to go into all the world and bring this message, taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the shield of faith, and pray, praise God. Praying that God would enable us to go and, and represent this kingdom in authority. And pray after this manner, Jesus said, Our Father which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. Now we know that the kingdom of God was ushered in in the first century. Jesus said, there's some of you here that will not taste death until you've seen the kingdom established in power. Amen. And so the book of Acts is still being written. The church triumphant. We're still alive, praise God. 2,000 years of hatred and persecution. And the church is still alive. But the one thing we lack in this country that will not only make us known as still alive, but cause us to begin to thrive again is persecution. To where they can see a church that lives in the supernatural. All that the church has thought of today is a gathering of people that perform certain liturgies and have all of these, you know, uh, different religious rites. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Is in power, the scripture says, amen. Amen. And so we want to talk about that this morning. Normative Christianity. Behold, I give you all power and all authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. So we want to talk about the fact this morning 
that many of us are walking and living substandard. We're not seeing the supernatural power in our prayer lives that we ought to see. Our prayers are not binding principalities and powers like they should. Our prayers, like Elijah, are not shutting up the heavens for three and a half years. Our prayers are not causing the lame to walk and the blind to see. And so we want to talk this morning about the fact that we need to see signs and wonders that this community could begin to realize Jesus is truly raised from the dead. Amen? So let's see if that's a biblical principle or not. Let's see if that's actually scriptural to think that that's something that should be taking place in the church today, especially as the fact that this Book of Acts is continuing to be written. Remember the great source of spiritual power, the Holy Ghost. Acts is very clear on this. That that promise of the Father, the baptism and the Holy Ghost, that they experienced on the day of Pentecost... And the scripture says, this promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. And so people today should still be being filled with the Holy Spirit. People today should be still working signs and wonders. People today should still be speaking in other tongues and prophesying because the book of Acts is still alive. And we are those that were afar off that this promise belongs to. Praise God. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Think about it. No substandard Christianity ever indicated in the scriptures. Jesus said, the things that I do shall you do also because I go to the Father. Now, we know what's happening right now when Jesus ascended to God's right hand. The Bible says he's at the right hand of God and he is ever living to make intercession for us. You want to know what Jesus is praying for us this morning? Father, give him the power, man. Let him go out and be examples of who I was when I was here on the earth. Those that have seen you have seen me, Jesus said. Oh, Father, that that would become a reality. Don't we want people to look on us and see us as loving as Jesus was? As merciful as Jesus was? But you know, most people just see Jesus as that loving, merciful Lamb of God. But let's remember that his life was more than that. His life was an example of what a believer should be when he said, I did not come to do my own will, but the will of he that sent me. Amen. If we want to emulate Jesus, then we need to find out what God's will is for our lives, not try to get God to bless our will. Our agendas. Who am I and what does God have for me in the body of Christ? How can I lay my life down and become a better servant? That's not always what people are looking for. We're looking for people to serve us. How can I become a better servant? You want to be like Jesus? How can I become the least among us? You want to be like Jesus? Why aren't you the foot washer of the rest of us? That's what it means to be like Jesus. Well, there's other things that it means to be like Jesus. If we're going to emulate him and he's given us his mantle and to take up the ministry. We're thankful for Jesus who was 
the substitutionary sacrifice on the cross, the lamb that was slain from before the foundations of the world, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And we're so thankful for that part of his ministry. Amen. That great redemption. We who were bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. Thank God for that. But there was more than Jesus' substitutionary ministry. Let's look into the scripture again, and we talked about this recently. But the Bible says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of the devil. Amen? Amen. Now, we're to be about that business. That's why Jesus came, and that's why he left us here and gave us power. Now, the fact of the matter is, most of the people in the church are afraid of the devil, if they even believe in him anymore. Take a survey of Christian churches today, and Christians don't even believe that Satan is a personality. An actual, individual personality. In many Christians' minds today, Satan is an evil influence. Now, I'm not talking about fundamentalists, but I'm talking about in the sphere of perceived Christendom. They don't believe in a personal devil that has to be dealt with individually. The Bible says, you resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Amen? Amen? We have a responsibility to pull these strongholds down in our lives. It's our personal responsibility. Many of us will cry out to God like, like Paul did. Lord, you know, Satan was beating him. The scripture says that because of the abundance of his revelations. Now, basically what that says is the more spiritual you get, the more Satan will attack you. Isn't that what happened to Jesus? And Satan took him into the wilderness and there was that affliction. We see that with Paul. We see it in Peter's life. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan desires to sift you, but I've prayed for you, praise God. There's this war that's going on in the spirit realm. We need to be cognizant of it, and we need to be ready at all times to be involved in this war and to do our part. We need to be ever ready through intercession. And then when he speaks, take the opportunity to destroy the works of the evil one, as the scripture says. And so Paul, in the abundance of that revelation, Satan was sent to buffet him and beat him black and blue, is what the scripture says. And he said, I sought the Lord three times to deliver me from this. And the response of the Lord to him was what? My grace is sufficient for you. Now, what do you think that means? Grace. My grace is sufficient. Does that just mean, no, you're going to have to just stay there and let the devil beat the tar out of you? What he's saying is, I have already given you all power and all authority. I'm here. In your weakness, I'm going to make you strong, praise God. My strength is perfected in weakness. But Paul, you've written these epistles. You have this revelation. Of the greater one that lives inside of you. Of the mandate that no weapon formed against us can prosper. Paul 
Paul, you take the authority. My grace is sufficient. You've called upon my name and I'm wanting you to know I'm there. I'm present for you. You, where do you think Paul came up with this stuff? You resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen. Now, what is it that causes us to be able to resist Satan? What's the first thing he says before he says resist the devil? And so as we humble ourselves, as we present ourselves and submit ourselves to God. We're enabled then to resist the devil. You see how those things went hand in hand, the abundance of his revelation. God wants to keep us humble. We are no match for Satan until we're humbled sufficiently to realize that of ourselves we can do nothing. Amen. Amen. Thus Paul writes, without him I can do nothing, praise God. But then he goes on and says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And so in this life, we're going to experience adverse circumstances. We're going to be overwhelmed so that we can be humbled, so that God can be glorified as he delivers us and visits us. And that power that, that he gave us in the Holy Ghost manifests itself in our lives. So let's turn to Acts chapter 2 and... Look at this one verse that I think is, is very powerful that we'll use as the foundational verse for this morning. And here in Acts chapter 2, of course, for those of us that are spirit-filled believers, Acts chapter 2, the first thing we think about is Pentecost. And rightfully so. Chapter 2, verse 16, when the Spirit of God had been poured out upon them in the upper room, verse 16 says, this is that, hallelujah, that was promised, spoken by the prophet Joel, that said, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And so we see then that that great promise of the prophet Joel had been manifested. They were told in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, go to Jerusalem and, and tarry and wait for the promise. I think that's something that some of us have missed out on at times. And I don't think that it has to be perceived as just one event. But I think some of us who have not yet experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit have lost the spirit of tarrying. We get discouraged. We make Attempts and then it's no longer on our mind. When your heart's cried out for the fullness of God and you've been believing for the power to come from on high, as the scripture says, and you don't experience it at that moment, don't let it be stolen from your heart. Be as excited and, and anticipating the next day as you were at that moment and the next day and the next day until the promise comes. Amen. Don't lose sight of it. Don't lose the hunger. Don't lose that, that expectation that at any moment, God's fullness is going to rise up. Expect to wake up in the morning full of the Holy Ghost, praying in a new prayer language. Hallelujah. Thank you for being with us today. We look forward to you joining us next week on Sword of the Spirit. We're here to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. If this message has ministered to, challenged, or inspired you, please visit us at swordofthespirit.org 